If you've been putting off growing plants indoors because you said the equipment was too expensive or too complicated, forget it. Clap a hat upon your head if you still possess that forgotten thing, a hat, and go off to the nearest garden centre. You don't need very much, and what you have can be easily stored, as I'm going to show you in this program, which fundamentally enough is called... Partly because I've lived in the same house for a very long time, and partly because I have the makings of a pack rat, the place where I grow my plants has accumulated an incredible amount of rubbish, which I don't really need for gardening. I have a sampling of it, Roger. I mean, what does one do with plants with old tubing? I'm not too keen on a paintbrush in horticulture. That's crap. In fact, I could garden just as well with almost nothing to do that over there. The thing is, I don't need old buckets to grow plants. These sort of come down to my cellar, like old elephants that go to a secret place to die. Let's get the hole there. That's better. Now, you see, we can get along just as well without all that. Starting with a nice clean slate. What have you got to have to grow plants? Well, you do really need something to water with. And if you can get a nice watering can with a sprout that comes off, spout, not sprout, excuse me, and you can clean, well and good. If you go buying one, don't get a dinky little thing you have to refill every few minutes because it's nothing but a pest. And if you don't want to get a watering can, there's nothing wrong with an old kitchen kettle. Only don't forget that if you hold that over your head, you're going to get a torrent of water down you when you water. So that it's not a bad idea to take the lid down before you do any overhead work. Something of that sort. Then you've got a perfectly good if temporary watering can. You also should try and get one of these misters. And pretty soon, and sooner rather than later, it's going to go out of order because these nozzles get clogged, and no poking about with a piece of wire is going to do any good once it's gone. But they're not expensive, and if it goes at a great emergency moment in your plant's life, use the domestic counterpart. And if we're going to say wash it out before you use it, whatever last was in it is not going to help plant life. Well, those are the first absolute essentials. And if I was starting all over again. I think I would devise for myself what I would call learn to love a plant box. It's just something like a carton, which you could easily store anywhere. And the necessities that you would have to have are not very great, at least to start with. Probably you'll need clippers. And clippers have become a bit of a cult. You can have the kind that clang, like swords. And if I may be a little patriotic, I unpatriotic perhaps, I might say they have a tendency to clang shut on my hands. Then there is the kind that has a long nose for uh, careful or fiddling work. It depends upon your temperament when you describe them. There's the sort that's got non-stick blade with molded to your hand. Or you can just go out and buy a pair of clippers, which is mainly what I do. And if you don't even want to do that, you can use a highly domestic object, a pair of kitchen shears. Only do let me advise you to have two pairs of shears. It isn't just that they'll never be where you want them, but they're might be members of your family, or highly sanitary members of your family, who would disapprove of having kitchen shares associated with fundamental horticultural objects like our dried cow manure. 
I belong possibly to the school of thought that thinks that I don't want my gardening tools contaminated by association with food. For instance, if there were to be an extremely icky uh, nectarine in the family kitchen, and you were to set to work to clean it up, you clearly had forgotten to order, and you were going to have to give somebody fruit for breakfast, and you didn't want them to know like that it looked like that beforehand. So, and then, which I'm sure you never would do, but were you mistakenly then to take that unwashed and clip a leaf on a plant, you would carry this mold spore from, oh, falling over, you can see, it's all this disgusting as uh, from the scissors to the plant. Contamination is, after all, a two-way, this is throwing away a day, a two-way street. So what else do we have to have? All horticulture consists of a good deal of mixing things up. And I think that you need plastic, a square or rectangular plastic base. In that you can mix your soils and you don't really need anything more than a small cup to bale the soil out with. I mean, this is child's play. But when you come to mix soils, which you have to do, all gardening consists of putting one thing in with another. You're going to have to mix it with your hands if you don't have anything else to mix it with. Well, that's fine and good by me. It does lead to a good deal of talking like this with your hands usually clasped or sitting on them at an elaborate party, which makes uh, talking and eating particularly difficult at a dinner party. But some people work in gloves to solve that problem. And if you work in gloves, do not get cute objects with green thumbs. These are very heavy and really no good for this kind of work. The kind of gloves that Boris Karloff might have used when indulging in one of his more elaborate scenes are also not very good for gardening because the important point of gardening are the tips of your fingers, the sensitivity of your fingers. So if you're going to have to wear gloves, use the very thinnest that you possibly can get hold of. I don't go in for gardening in gloves, and for those of you who don't, I would suggest you get a trowel. Now, a trowel is another object about which there are a great many schools of thought. A trowel needs to be useful, to be properly balanced, to work, almost do its own work, like the head of a golf club, if you're playing golf properly. This one has a wooden handle, a very heavy blade, and if you press down with it, the twist of mixing soil, it practically turns itself over. I find it very much better than the kind that has the stainless steel blade. If you're doing heavy work, this bends, and it is not nearly so well balanced. Above all, don't let yourself in for one of these all-metal jobs with holes in the handles to lighten it. All that happens is that those holes set the patterns of the blisters, even on my hardened hands, and it's, this is a pure agony. Never, ever let anyone sell you one of those. But I think you will find that a trowel is something that you have great need of in your work. You also could do with something you're not going to have to go out and buy, and that's an ordinary kitchen fork. You'll do all kinds of small jobs with that. You'll scratch the top of the soil, you'll lever out little plants. There are a great many things you can do, and all useful. And another very helpful object is an ice kick. It belongs to the medieval period, practically, nowadays, but it has very modern uses. These sandwich boxes are wonderfully good for starting seeds, but they're solid. And you can't possibly grow seeds in a solid thing. But if you put a red-hot ice pick on it, 
you can bore holes in no time flat. You also probably will have this frightful smell to come up. There we are. That could have seeds in it. And also these plastic pots frequently have rotten bread. You know, that's absurd for a pot that size. And a really hot ice pick will make an extra. See how it goes? Okay, or you can enlarge the existing hole. I'm not going to do it. Come on, come on. There we go. Not quite hot enough. That goes. A little bit extra. Careful. That's one of its points, but it has another use than that. It's also extremely useful for testing whether a plant has proper drainage. Now, you see, I threw all those back in that lover box carton. I would, could put that in, except I think it's rather too hot. And those are all you need as basic equipment. You do need some supplies. You ought to have, if possible, some all-purpose soil, which you could buy absolutely anywhere. It comes all sterile and prepackaged and rather fine, and a lot of plants need extra things put on it. So into it, you have to add things like peat, uh, sphagnum moss, which comes in a small package, peat moss, And also our old friend perlite. And you can get little packages that are about this size of all of them. So you'd have four packages of this sort, which you would keep in your box. But if you could be fortunate enough to find a salesman who sold what is called soilless mixes, you needn't have any of all these additional things. Now, a soilless mix is very much in nowadays in Europe, and we're a little lagging behind here. Basically, it's made of sphagnum moss. It's sterile, it's extremely light in weight, it holds the water, and it's fortified. That's to say, it's had nourishment put in it. And this one has been put up by the Cornell University formula, and it's relatively complicated. You could make it at home. It's for sphagnum, for vermiculite, which I think rather squashes down. I prefer perlite, superphosphates, various fertilizers. You can make it, I doubt if you will, but you could make it, and if you could buy it, it's extremely useful. So also is this much finer one, which is put up by one of the big seed companies. But you see how fine that is, and that's really only for seedlings, you've got to have a coarser one for anything that is well grown. These are just beginning to appear up in the market here. They're the, 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 the thing in Europe where they're put up in the right consistencies and for special kinds of plants, and for plants that need acid conditions and plants that need alkaline. And I have a friend who makes her own mixture for her azaleas, and she grows far better azaleas than any of the rest of us grow, just with wit, peat moss, and perlite. And don't ask me the proportions, because horticulturalists just sort of know the proportions when it's right. She mixes it up, and she grows her azaleas just in that plain mixture. But there is one catch to these soilless mixes. Though they're very light, and you can carry enormous pots round without fainting or failing. They haven't much nourishment. And if you use them, you've got to use a fertilizer, a feed, with them all the time. If you're well organized, that'll be no problem for you. But if you're teaching your family to love plants, uh, may I advise you to stay away from fish fertilizers? At any rate, to begin with, it's very reminiscent of a fish market on a hot day always. It's better to use one of these water-soluble fertilizers that are entirely innocuous and can be watered in with nobody knowing anything about it except plant roots. But you do have to be very well organized if you're going to use the uh, 
soilless mixes because you have to give regular feeding. I forgot, which was a shame, and I'm going to put it in now, that many of us don't like the colour of perlite. And we do sometimes use uh, coarse sand instead in our pots. And it's a fine state of affairs when ordinary sand now is bought neatly packaged for a large price. Well, when you go and get these various supplies, I suggest you take a rather cynical friend with you in order to that she can prevent you buying anything that is labelled miracle. There's no such thing in horticulture. Just stick to these few fundamental basics. And don't get carried away and buy a lot of pots. Most plants come to us in soil that will last them for a reasonably long time. Just buy a one or two pots, slightly larger than the size of the plant you're in. Do not come back with a carton full of pots as well. It's quite unnecessary. And probably not much is needed for that plant for a long time, except Here's our ice book. The test to see whether it is properly cropped, whether it has proper internal drainage. Now you may say, that's fine, I don't have an ice pick. What am I going to find out? If you've got an ice pick, you can go straight in. But you come out the other end. I don't really understand myself in that activity. But anything will do. And then is the time in a shop that I've seen whether a plant has been properly cropped by doing it with my uh, spectacles. I don't know that it does my hair much good, but it does show me whether I'm being sold a plant that won't live. And if I find a plant that is improperly crocked, has no internal drainage, then when I get it home, it simply has to be changed. It has to be taken out of its pot and some internal crocking put in. As a school of thought that thinks you should get them out of the pot by rather gentle methods, to push against it with a stick. Well, it's fine, and it may come out, even though there's nothing to push against, with a small plant, but it's not going to come out with a big plant. I'm not going to go around pushing big plants out with a small stick. I prefer to knock mine out in this way, which really does not hurt them. And see, well, now look at that. That's got some rather, ah, rather rubbishy eh? sand. And you wonder if disintegrated. The roots have had absolutely nothing to hold on to. What's this area needs is a waste of paper button. And if you find something like that that you've got to re crock, then you have several alternatives. Now let's suppose I'm going to rescue that plant. You can use shirts. If you're an old fashioned gardener like me, you'll have plenty of them because you'll have broken dozens of pots in your day. But I don't think I've made enough of the fact that you shouldn't use dirty shirts. I've often said you shouldn't use dirty pots, but dirty shirts are just as bad. But if you want to, you can use them. Put them in the bottom of the pot. If you don't have crocs, and many a high-rise liver has no crocs, you can use stones, the kind that come from the florist. Put a thin layer of them in. Or you can use something that I rather inclined to take credit as my own invention, though I guess so I shall be told it's not. This perlite absorbs an enormous amount of moisture. Now if you put it in a pot dry, you observe it all falls out. But if you moisten it and it sucks it up, or over sucks that up and you put it in. See, it does not fall out, but it does let the surplus water drip out. So again, my mother used to say my progress was always marked by torrents of water. Maybe my name had something to do with that. But be that as it may, this makes an extremely good, very trouble-free crocking for a plant. And it has an additional advantage, apart from the fact that it's quite easy to buy good one of these occasions. Let me show you. Now here's a plant that I crocked with shirts. And though it's doing very well, it's time I potted it up. And here you can see 
that the roots have grown right over these sherds, and that to get them out, which I ought to do, I am bound to damage some of these very important feeding roots. That's, or as it were, strike one against the crocs. This one is potted up to stones, or was potted up to stones, and an old piece of croc. And you can see where I've got such a depth of stones here that if I were to repot this with these stones in place, the plant really would not be getting much more benefit from the new soil. But the one that I planted up in perlite The roots have grown right over it, and I'm not going to have to do anything about that. I'm not going to have to pry this perlite out. All I need to do is put more soil in on top of the perlite base I've put here, and put the whole capsule in without any further trouble, enormously minimizing potting up shock. These are the supplies, then. Those are the plants. And when you go off to buy your equipment, there's another thing that you ought to be told to get, which I don't think is made quite enough of by people advising novice gardeners. You really always should buy some stakes. All house plants no matter how carefully, lovingly grown, lean towards the light. You twist and turn, but they still do so. And they look enormously better staked or pulled back. Now, what I would describe as the domestic stake, I consider rather an unfortunate sight. The broken pencil and the boot lace, I do not feel adds much to the grace of that plant. But if you have a plant like this, which I'm sure its owner thinks is full of character, I did not raise this, this belongs to somebody else. It may be full of character, but I think it looks deplorable. And what it needs, it really needs a walking stick, but what it's going to have to have is a very strong stake to bring it back. Now, the, for most ordinary work, I like to use very fine wool when I'm staking because it's the least obtrusive of any. Pull the thing back. So, there goes the wool. But, illustrating my point exactly, when you have a large and obstinate plant, you can buy some of this paper-covered wire, which is fixed like that and will pull your plant right up into position. So, now the owner probably will say that he thinks nothing of this at all. My opinion, it looks a hundred percent better. What also could also do is repotting. I'm not running a plant clinic for other people now. Then there are other kinds of plants that need staking. Now here's a gloxinia, which is getting middle-aged spread. It's full of bud and it ought to last for months, but unless it's pulled up, it's going to lose its good impression. And you'll see, you'll put the stakes all around it rather carefully, and you pull it in equally carefully, not the least like that, with the world. And the point about this is that the staking, once it's done, the stake should not stay up like periscopes. There we come. I mean, no plant staked up like that is going to look good if you've got these. And they must be clipped off. And here, in all truth, I have to admit that the kitchen shears won't work. <laughs> Go as hard as you like. They're not going to work. If you've got as far as staking, you better have clippers. These are the minimal clippers, but even so, you'll see, they work.
perfectly well. So we've got a lot of basic equipment. It's not taking up much room. In a minute I'm going to put it all in there. And with it we can rescue what I would consider even a hopeless case. Do what? This I also borrowed. This is a very sad sight. You could teach a child its letters by counting the number of leaves it's lost. Look, A, B, C, D. I never saw a sadder object in all my days. It has been grown in much too small a pot, and its roots have gradually got themselves right through into the subsoil. Ah. In the theory of the thing of having these stones is all right, but you can't carry it to this rather ludicrous extreme. You've then got to get this out, and as you get it out, you've got to be rather careful not to break that leading root. There we are. And you see it was planted with crocs, which I've got to try and pry out. See them here? Right in the heart of the thing. I think how much better this would be if this was perlite. And another. Poor wretch. And now we have to try and get it back into a better pot. And I'm going to give it the perlite treatment. What do with my wet perlite? Add a little more on. Put in some of that. Well. So. Now, if we put soil into this, all round, I think we're going to be able to rescue what I would have said was an absolute death scene. But you can see for yourself but it was very far gone, and I'm not quite sure how we can do this, that we're going to be able to save it. But I'm not using a single thing that we didn't have. Then you give it the usual watering and put it away. So now let's put all our equipment into our box. The spare pot, the ice pick, and there you are. You're not going to be content with this minimal amount of tools. I wasn't. Nor will you. And that's rather the fun of gardening. Because once you've begun, you work out what suits you best. And after all, that is the point of this series, which is called... Cool.